In this chapter, you are going to learn some of the basic macroeconomic theories that have guided our um, understanding of macroeconomics for several centuries. The very um, first formal thought about macroeconomics um, is what we call the classical economic perspective. And this perspective um, historically uh, was rooted in Adam Smith, uh, who wrote a book called The Wealth of Nations in 1776. And in that book, he laid the foundation for um, just an understanding of the big picture. Um, and essentially, the idea was at that time that the macro economy was something that really guided itself. And uh, it was just something that they could observe. This thought was formalized um, into uh, a law that became known as Say's Law. Um, this law was formalized by a French economist, Jean-Baptiste Say, who believed that supply creates its own demand. And essentially what that law means is that in an economy, the businesses seem to know what they're doing, and if the businesses are left alone to do what they would naturally know to do, the economy would always just adjust itself back to a full employment level of gross domestic product. It was a very laissez-faire type perspective on the economy. It essentially said we don't need to do anything. We just observe it and let the businesses do what they know how to do. And this sort of made sense, if you, if you think about it, if a business recognizes that it's not selling uh, its products, um, it will change course. Nobody needs to direct it to change course. It will automatically know it might have to lay off some employees. It might realize it needs to change its prices. It might realize it needs to change the products that it produces. Nobody needs to tell the business to do those things. Likewise, if a business is doing really well and can't keep enough product on the shelf, they'll realize they need to hire some more workers and produce more. There's nobody that needs to tell them to do that. The business pretty much knows that they need to do those things on their own. So the classical economic theory worked pretty well um, from 1776 until the Great Depression. And during the Great Depression of the 1930s, the economists realized that um, something different was happening. Um, and it seemed as though the economy was not fixing itself. The economy was not adjusting. So along comes an, an economist by the name of John Maynard Keynes, um, who essentially flipped the perspective around. And he said that the problem during the Great Depression had to do with the fact that people had no money, they'd lost their jobs. And if we could just somehow uh, figure out how to get money into the hands of people, they could then start spending again, and that'll help the businesses out. Essentially, it said that it was the consumer side of the economy that pretty much drived the ups and downs. And this is a very short run perspective. Uh, whereas the classical economic thought was very long run, it said in the long run, things would fix itself. Keynes believed in the long run, we're all dead. Um, and so we really need to focus on the short run. And you have to understand the history at that time. The Great Depression was not just this um, short little couple months long recession. It lasted for years um, and it got very bad. And so Keynes said, maybe we need to actually intervene into the economy and do something uh, to manipulate the business cycle. So the foundation of Keynesian economic thought has to do with what's called the consumption function. And Keynes focused on two different types of consumption. One type of consumption is called autonomous consumption. This is the amount that a consumer would spend even if they had no income. So consider if you had no income, 
how much money would you actually still have to pay? You might have bills to pay. You may have a mortgage. Uh, you obviously have to put food on the table. Um, you may have some obligations that even if you lost your job and had no income, you might still have to pay those obligations. Now, autonomous consumption is going to be different for everybody, of course, um, but essentially this is the amount that you would have to spend even if you had no income. And I always tell students, if you can get by without spending anything when you have no income, that means that you have somebody else who's supporting you. So please make sure to say thank you. So autonomous consumption was Keynes's starting point. Then he recognized that as people gained income, this induces them to spend more money. So consumption will rise as we gain more income because we have this um, sort, of, sort of this induced perspective that now that I have a little more money, my consumption can rise. And this is gonna be different for everybody. There are some people who are savers and more income really doesn't increase their consumption. And there are some people who are spenders that if you give them more income, they spend it all. So the consumption function graphically begins, begins as a basic graph with income, disposable income on the X axis and consumption on the Y axis. So what Keynes starts with is imagining a hypothetical uh, line that says, what if the consumer spent exactly the same amount as their income? And if they spend exactly the same amount as their income, there would be this 45 degree line. Now this is hypothetical. So if they had a thousand in income and they spent a thousand, uh, that's a point on this 45 degree line. If they had 4,000 in income, and spent 4,000, that's a point on this hypothetical line. So this is a reference line. The consumption function begins with autonomous consumption. So for example, if this person had zero income, but they had bills to pay, they had an autonomous consumption of $2,000. So that's the first point. And then as they gain income, their consumption begins to rise. So let's give this person their first thousand dollars of income and their consumption rises a little bit. So maybe it rises to $2,500. And if we keep going in this same general direction, we get the consumption function. So the consumption function is this line, um, this graph that shows how much spending a person or an economy would have at different levels of disposable income. So you will notice that in this um, consumption function, if you are spending more than what you're earning, then you have what's called dis savings. You actually are having to somehow make up the difference, uh, maybe from savings accounts or borrowing money. Um, but somehow you would have to make up the difference. So if this person had a thousand in income and their spending ex is expected to rise to 2,500, well, they have to make up the difference somehow. And so that might be they pull it out of a savings account. Now on the flip side, if the um, person is spending less, than what they're actually earning, then they would have savings. So for example, if this person had 5,000 in income, they would expect to only spend $4,500. So that extra $500 would go into savings. So you'll notice for this individual or, or this economy, we can just aggregate it together, at, at $4,000 of income, they would expect to spend 4,000 um, in consumption. And at that point, they would break even. So if you're spending more than what you're earning, you have this savings. If you're spending less than what you're earning, you would have 
savings. So that slope, if you'll remember from a math class, slope is defined as rise over run. So essentially the slope of the consumption function is crucial to understanding Keynesian theory. The slope of that function defines how much our spending rises when we gain more income. So that slope says it's going to be rise over run. So that's the change in consumption over the change in income. And that's defined as the marginal propensity to consume or MPC. So the MPC is essentially the, the amount by which your consumption rises when you gain more income. So if I gain another dollar of income, how much does my consumption rise? That's the MPC. So logic should tell you that the slope of that line should be less than one. Um, if, you, if you gain a thousand more dollars of income, your spending should not increase by more than a thousand dollars. It may increase by the thousand, but it shouldn't increase by more than that. And for most individuals, that, that holds true. So we also have the marginal propensity to save. And theoretically, if you gain more income, you either spend it or you save it. So the marginal propensity to consume plus the marginal propensity to save should equal one. So for example, if you gain another dollar of income and your spending rises by 90 cents, then that means your savings should have gone up by an additional 10 cents. So the marginal propensity to consume determines the slope of the consumption function. And it's going to be different for everybody. If you're a, a, a saver, you're going to have a low marginal propensity to consume. More money really doesn't increase your spending. If you're a spender, you'll have a high marginal propensity to consume. If you're a spender, more money means more spending. So now there are things that are going to shift the consumption function, and, and we'll talk about all of these. Um, the first being wealth. So wealth um, is that part of our assets. It's not a flow of money. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's... Um, a stock of money. Um, so a flow of money would be your income. The stock of money that you might have available is your wealth. So your total wealth is the total value of all of your assets, savings accounts, investments, uh, house, uh, property. Um, those are your assets. Take away any outstanding liabilities. So for example, if you have a house, but you have a mortgage, you don't really own the house. Um, but if you own the house outright without a mortgage, but you have a very large credit card debt, then your wealth subtracts your credit card debt. So in general, we've observed that as people gain wealth, their consumption function actually will increase. Um, the idea is that you have more wealth at all levels of income, whatever it is, you now have more obligations and your consumption function might begin to rise. Um, so as an extreme example, let's say that you inherit millions of dollars and you go buy a second house. Obviously, your autonomous consumption is going to rise. Maybe you still work, but you now have two homes to take care of. So your autonomous consumption would rise and that would shift the entire consumption function upwards. The interest rates also will shift your consumption function. So essentially an interest rate might be a reward for how much you save. Um, or if you're borrowing money, you might have to pay an interest rate. So in general, we've realized that when there's an increase in the interest rate, there's a decrease in consumption spending. 
As an extreme example, um, if you have a savings account, um, right now you are probably not earning a lot on, of interest on your savings account. Um, but if I were to tell you that there was a bank that opened up in town and they were offering savings accounts with 50% interest, I guarantee you a whole lot of people would try to find as much change as they could in their sofas to put it in the bank at 50% interest. Well, if you're going to put money in the bank for the savings, that means you're not spending it. So with an increase in the interest rate, your consumption is going to fall. If interest rates go down, then theoretically your consumption rises. It may not even be worth it for you to cash that birthday check and put it in the bank. Um, just take the money and, and go spend it. Um, it. It might not even be worth the gas to, to, to go to the bank right now. So the higher the interest rate, the lower the spending. Prices also matter. And this is a little bit maybe counterintuitive, but we have to recognize how much purchasing power we actually have. So in real terms, as the price levels rise, we're actually not purchasing in real terms as much as we normally were. So when we have inflation, the consumption function actually goes down in real terms. We're actually purchasing less. Even though prices are higher, we're actually consuming less because we're not able to buy as much as we once were. Durable goods are things that uh, when we purchase them, they tend to last uh, for multiple years. In general, it's thought to be five years or more. Um, so for example, uh, a washing machine, a dishwasher, uh, a refrigerator, a car, these are all durable goods. So as we have an increase in our desire for durable goods, then our consumption function tends to also increase. Uh, so for example, if, if you end up, um, if, if there's this increased demand for cars, well, that means automatically there's going to be more gas that we have to purchase, more oil, more tires, more everything else. Um, we don't just go buy the car. We have to consider all the increased spending that goes with the purchase of that durable good. And lastly, our expectations matter. So if you were to anticipate that your future income uh, was looking good, if you were going to anticipate, I'm getting a raise next week, you might actually go increase your spending right now. The consumption function might increase right now because you have this expectation of higher income in the future. And likewise, if you had this expectation that you were going to lose your job, your consumption function right now probably ought to go down. Um, very few people say, oh, today's the day I'm going to lose my job, so I better go buy the car right now. Um, they typically drop their consumption when they have low expectations of future income. So there, there are um, other things that might have an impact on um, our consumption function. It's sort of hard to tell how it will impact, but things like inheritances, if you have this expectation of an inheritance, um, you may have uh, this expectation of how long you're going to live. Um, we've determined that consumption functions tend to change through through the course of a person's life um, and that as individuals age, their consumption function tends to rise. Um, but then as they age past a certain point, it is believed that consumption functions um, will eventually fall. So Keynes also focused on another key component of what drives the business cycle and that's investment spending. So investment spending is what the businesses are doing. So in looking at investments, Keynes had this perception 
that investments actually were extremely volatile, um, that we couldn't really stabilize um, our understanding of what the businesses are, are actually going to do. The classical economist essentially believed that the interest rate determined the level of investment. And it was a very simple, as interest rates rise, the level of investment um, activity goes down. Um, for the classical economists, they would simply say that if it becomes too expensive for the business to take out the loan to build a factory, they won't build the factory. And as interest rates go down, then businesses take out loans and build lots of new factories. That was a classical perspective. Keynes said there's a little bit more to it than that. And a lot of what Keynes focused on had this perception that it's based on what do we expect as our return from this investment? So for example, there are some things that if, if we do them, they're going to greatly impact our productivity and our ability to produce and will have a large impact on the bottom line. There's a few projects for which that might exist. There's probably lots of little things that could be done to improve a business's bottom line. Um, so for example, if, if you have a job, you think about um, all those times that you said, you know, if, if the business just did this, it would help them out. Sometimes there's little things. If they just switch the way the, the customer line went uh, from left to right and right to left, that might increase the flow of traffic and might better help us serve them. That's a, that's a little thing. There might be big things that could help a business. For example, um, I remember uh, once um, when I was growing up, uh, the local McDonald's, um, they, they were full uh, all the time. And so they decided to actually build a second kitchen. Um, and instead of, they, they really uh, had a hard time just expanding their one kitchen. So they just added on a completely separate part to this building, which was kitchen number two. And essentially they had a kitchen for the drive-through and a kitchen for the, the dine-in. And uh, that was a big thing. The return on investment, you, you would hope would be really large from that. But if you were going to do something like that, um, you, would, you would need to take out a loan. Keynes believed that we would only take out loans at high interest if we believe that it was going to have a high impact on the business's bottom line. So there's really only a couple of projects that might require that kind of investment. Keynes believed that there would be a lot of things that we'd be willing to borrow at low rates of interest because they might only impact the bottom line by one or 2%. So he said that the level of investment will go down um, as the interest rate rises, simply because there's fewer projects that would make that a worthwhile activity. So as the interest rate falls, it becomes more profitable to take out those loans because they, they will earn um, that return on the investment. So the investment demand curve is a simply a, a downward sloping demand curve at high rates of interest, there's less investment that's going to occur. At low rates of interest, there's more investment that will occur. There are things that will shift the investment. And one of these is the key part to understanding Keynesian uh, perspective on businesses is that there's a little bit of this unknown, uh, and he called it animal spirits um, because he didn't know what else to call it. Um, this, the gut factor. Why do businesses do the things that they do? Sometimes there's just this gut feeling that we ought to do this. Um, and that's not something that can really be modeled um, because we can't really take into account uh, just people's intuition. Um, but generally, we do have this, this idea that if, if people's 
if businesses somehow begin to feel a little bit more confident, then they might increase their level of investment. But we don't necessarily know why they're feeling more confident. We also recognize that technology impacts our investment demand. Um, as businesses gain uh, more technological advances, investment demand tends to go up. The idea of capacity utilization affects our level of investment demand. And essentially what that means is if you're operating at a very high capacity, you might actually have an increased level of investment demand. If, if your business is already running full tilt and you've packed as many employees in there as you can um, and you still can't keep up, well, your investment demand might increase because now maybe you need to build a new factory. Taxes will also impact um, the level of investment demand. The idea is if business taxes go down, then that tends to increase our level of business investment uh, demand. Um, businesses are more likely to add that addition onto their factory uh, when the taxes are lower. So in general, what this chapter out, outlines are uh, a little bit of background into the two um, main economic perspectives about the economy. Um, the classical perspective had a very long run perspective, uh, believing that the economy would just automatically fix itself. Um, we would always stabilize in the long run at the full employment level of gross domestic product. Keynes, writing during the Great Depression, believed that the economy could find itself stuck in one of those phases of the business cycle, and maybe we needed to focus on the short run and determine what needs to be adjusted um, in order to get the economy to move into the next phase. And the foundation of Keynesian economic thought is that consumption function. And so we also discussed the marginal propensity to consume. That's the slope of the consumption function. And that tells you how much your consumption will increase as your income increases. And then we discussed a little bit about um, investment demand and the idea that uh, businesses uh, do have a demand for investment. Um, and the general perspective is that at higher levels of interest, the level of investment that is demanded would be less. Um, at low levels of interest, uh, the level of investment demand would be higher. So these are the foundations of the next several chapters um, in understanding economic, uh, macroeconomic theory um, and how the business cycle operates and what we should or, or should not uh, worry about in terms of the business cycle. Keynesian economic thought was a major perspective um, and a foundation to macroeconomic thought uh, for decades. Um, and uh, even to this day, Keynes still drives a lot of our understanding of macroeconomics.